Hi everyone, welcome to worship. Our scripture reading today is going to be from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 12 through 22. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is the one you praise. He is your God, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were seventy in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. The word of God for the people of God. Take a guess at home. How many pennies do you think are in this jar here? How many pennies do you think are in this jar? And I'll, I'll even give you some help. So this is what uh, one penny in a jar looks like. So how many do you think are in this jar? And you know, take your best guess, but I'm going to go ahead and spoil half the mystery right now. There are 936 pennies in this jar. But can anyone guess why there are 936 pennies in this jar? Now, in our scripture reading today, Moses proclaims an important truth. He says, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens. And what he's saying is, To God belongs the skies and the clouds that float around them, and the birds that fly through them, and the rains that fall from them. And to God belongs the stars and the planets and the moons, as well as the space in between. And to God belongs the heavenly host, all the angels. And then Moses, he goes on, he says, To the Lord your God also belong the earth and everything in it. So, so to God belong the mountains and the valleys, the plains and the deserts, the rivers and the seas, and, and to God belong the animals that creep and crawl and leap and gallop and swim and play, and to God belongs me, all that I have, and all that I am, everything belongs to God. And therefore, everything that is ours, all that we have and all that we are, our money, our time, our possessions, our strengths and weaknesses, our energy and our focus, our bodies, our health, our jobs, our hobbies, our relationships, our marriages, our children, everything. And sometimes I fall into this trap where on Sunday I, I praise and worship God and I proclaim, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. But then Monday rolls around and, and it's almost like I forget that God made Mondays as well. And then other times I think we stumble into this way of thinking about our lives is kind of broken down into segments or, or pieces of a pie chart. 
And so uh, this piece over here, this is our home life. And, and this other big piece over here is our work life. And meanwhile, this piece over here is, is our spiritual life. And this piece right here, well, this belongs to God. And so therefore, we do not go grocery shopping during the work portion or the spiritual portion of our lives. We don't go during the work hours, of course, right? We're working. And maybe we try not to go on Sundays. We, we try to keep them separate. And it's as if we think God has not ordained our grocery shopping and our dishwashing, or God cannot be glorified by our teaching a child how to read and do long division. But you see, if, if Moses is indeed correct that everything belongs to God, everything, then what that means for us today is that we are not owners, but stewards. Now, on Dictionary.com, stewardship, it's defined as the responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. And so what in our lives is worth caring for and preserving? Of all that God has given us, what, and more importantly, who, do we consider valuable enough in God's eyes that we need to protect and look after them? And when it really comes down to it, when we really stop to consider it, we realize that the entire pie chart of our lives should belong to God. And, and maybe right now, you only see those spiritual pieces of pie. Uh, maybe Sunday morning worship, or perhaps Sunday school, or, or so forth, or Code Purple dinners, or, or some other church activity you engage in. And maybe also certain times of the week you've set aside for prayer and scripture reading. Those pieces of pie you see as belonging to God. But what does it then look like to go deeper in our faiths? Does it look like making those pieces of pie bigger? Right? Like maybe adding an extra hour here for prayer, an extra hour of reading the Bible there. But the thing is, you only have 24 hours in a day and 168 in a week. And so is the ultimate goal to spend all 168 hours praying and reading and singing? But what if, what if instead going deeper in our faiths, what if it doesn't look like having those obviously spiritual activities just eclipse our lives? But instead, what if it looks like taking some of those other pieces of our lives and changing our perspective? No longer seeing them as belonging to us, but they now belong to God. And we are but stewards of them. All those pieces of our lives, everything that is ours, all that we have and all that we are, our money, time, possessions, our strengths, weaknesses, energy, focus, our bodies, health, jobs, hobbies, our relationships, our marriages, our children, everything. What would it look like to hand over a piece, just one piece, of all of that, just one piece of our lives to God, what would it look like? Two weeks ago, at the committal service for Sandra Mariner's mother, I followed our Methodist liturgy when I stood before the family and others who were present, and I prayed, Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Margaret, before she was ours, she is yours. Before she was ours, she is yours. She is, she always has been, and she will al and she always will be yours, O oh God. Or it can also look like this jar of pennies. I read about this on a blog by a woman named Erin Lynham. She was at church dedicating her son to the Lord during the service. And following the dedication, a mason jar full of pennies, with this one here, was placed into her hand. 
a, a mason jar heavy with the weight of exactly 936 shiny copper pennies. And her pastor then explained, in these jars is a penny for every week you will raise this child. And every week when you get home from church, remove one penny from the jar, and it will be a reminder of the time you have left to raise your child before they go out on their own. And for Aaron, this small but heavy, this small but heavy gift, it, it significantly impacted her perspective. And so she wrote about the burden she felt, right? The heaviness of it, not just in her hands, but, but on her heart, on her mind, and the fear in her heart to remove any of the pennies and just to feel the weight of those pennies emptied, never to return. And, and she wrote about how it, it pushed her to be more intentional with the tones she used with her kids and, and conversations she had, the habits she was displaying and passing on to them, and, and the movements, the, the moments, and the memories that she would hold on to in her heart. And she wrote about asking the same question again and again and again. How did I spend my penny this week? Right? How, how did I spend my pennies this month, this, this year? And she wrote about how she had this idea to add a second jar. A jar that started out empty, but to which she would add the pennies she was investing each week, each month, each year. And to her, this new jar, it represented the investment of a lifetime, truly the investment of an eternity. And as she finally deposited the first big batch of pennies, she said that she realized something monumental to motherhood. That as I draw those pennies from that jar on my desk, they are not being lost, misplaced, or tossed out to never see again. They are being invested. They are creating something new, something of great beauty, bravery, and kingdom importance. They are building my son into who God has created him to be. So imagine... What if all those pieces of our lives, all those different pieces of our lives, what if they could take on such a perspective shift? What if they could become something important and monumental? It's not easy to hand over all of those different pieces of our lives to God, though, is it? It's not even easy to hand over a penny, a week, to God. It is well worth it, sure, but even though it is well worth it, it is not easy. In my own life, I've found I have to do it slowly, a little bit at a time, not, not even a full piece at a time, not even a full penny, but, but a piece of a piece, a, a small crumb of a small pie piece here and there, uh, holding it out to God, uh, for God to take, but, but struggling to release it from my grasp. It kind of reminds me of getting in a pool, right? On, on a not particularly hot day when I'm fairly comfortable, getting in the pool, it can be rather uncomfortable, even a little scary, because you know you're going to have fun, but, but you dip your toes in and, and you wince at the cold sensation and, and that doubt starts to creep into your mind. Do you, do you really want to get in that thing? And so you either wade in slowly, maybe dropping down a step at a time and waiting a minute, or you bite the bullet and jump in and submerge your head trying to get over the shock quickly. And then you're in and, and swimming around and exploring the pool and all that it has to offer. But pools are so small. I think a better illustration is probably the ocean. Right? Because you, you face some of the same options. 
wading in slowly or, or sprinting in and diving through a wave, except that is only at one beach, no more than 50 feet from the bounds of the shore and, and not even 10 feet into the depths. And sometimes that piece of our lives we want to hand over is like getting over the shock of the cold waves splashing at our ankles. But, but sometimes handing it over, it feels more like facing our fear of sharks and whales and jellyfish and riptides and drowning in storms that come out of nowhere and threaten to toss our boat onto its side. Sometimes the water is clear and we know pretty much what we are getting ourselves into, and other times the water is so murky and dark, but we have no idea what lies two feet below the surface, let alone 10,000 feet. But then there are those times when we get over our fears and we take the leap, and we plunge beneath the surface, and suddenly we discover new depths and beauty. We discover coral reefs and schools of clownfish and hordes of sea turtles, and in our own lives, who knows what we might discover. Maybe we hand over a relationship to God, and we begin to ask, what do you, God, what do you want me to do in this relationship. And God's answer, maybe it will seem scary. Maybe God will want us to take our conversation to new depths, to ask questions we've never asked before, to attempt to penetrate some long-standing walls of intimacy, and we're unsure if we really want to try. But then we take the plunge, and, and that relationship is transformed. And the change is so uncomfortable and continues to be scary, and yet that relationship also becomes more life-giving than ever before. Or maybe you take some chunk of your bank account that you realize you don't actually need, and you take the really dangerous step of asking God what he wants you to do with it. And when you hear an answer, it can feel like the waves are, are tossing and turning and storms can suddenly appear in your life that make you feel it'd be safer to hold on to it, to stay in the boat. But then Jesus, he's out there on the waves calling you to let go of the money, to let go of the boat and get out and to come walk with him. And in those scary monumental moments, what will we do? Three thoughts I'd like to close with. Three hopefully reassuring thoughts. The first is, wading into the ocean takes time. Right? E even if you try to run out there, the waves, they buffet you and the water slows you down. A and once you're out there, you cannot explore it all at once. E even if you spent your entire life exploring the depths, how much of it could you actually see? You could never run out in your lifetime. So wading out into the ocean and exploring it, it takes risk and commitment and effort, yeah, but, but it also takes time. Sometimes you can make big strides, but sometimes all you can manage is a desire, a yearning, a leaning forward, but you just can't seem to get your feet to move. And in those moments... Just keep facing out, facing towards the sea, facing towards Jesus, and have patience with yourself. Which brings me to my second thought. You need to have patience with yourself just as Jesus will have patience with you. And just as Jesus had patience with Peter, who stepped out of the boat but soon started sinking as his fears took hold, and just as Jesus had patience with the rest of his disciples who didn't even try to get out of the boat. Jesus, he's standing out in the midst of the ocean, beckoning us to join him and to explore life with him, to experience the untold depths of God's love with him. But when we can't get our feet to move, well, Jesus looks at us and loves us, and then he moves towards us and joins us on the boat. And there will be more opportunities to take those leaps and to join Jesus. It's not one chance and you miss it, you're done. There will be more opportunities. But also in the midst of our failures, 
Jesus never misses an opportunity to be with us and to let us know that we are not loved any less. We, we might be missing out on greater life, but we are never loved any less. Which brings me to my third and final thought. Just as Jesus joins us in our triumphs and successes as well as our struggles and failures, we are called to be his church and body by being there for one another. See, being part of the church, being part of a church family, it looks like supporting one another, challenging one another to go deeper, sometimes giving a needed push, and other times showing them the love and grace and patience of Jesus. It, it looks like walking alongside one another on the journey, not leaving someone behind, but sticking it out with them, even when the storms of their life seem to be flooding a bit into our own lives. Because this is not a solo journey. It is a journey we go on with Christ and with one another. In a moment, um, I'm going to play some music on here and, and offer you a time of reflection. Um, maybe you find a, a piece of paper or a note card to write on. But here's what I want you to write down. I want to challenge you to write this down. First, I want you to write down um, some piece of your life that you want to try to hand over to God. A piece of your life, whatever it might be, money, your job, your health, maybe a relationship with a family member or a particular friend. Whatever that piece might be, no matter how big or small, if you want to try to hand it over to God, then I want you to write it down. And then after you've written it down, I want you to think about what the first step of that would look like. What is a small step you can do? A, a small step you think you could actually take in that direction, and, and, and if you can think of something, some small, hopefully not too terribly scary challenge, then go ahead and write that down as well. And then finally, I want you to think about who you might want to accompany you on that challenge. Now, maybe it's a spouse or maybe a friend from church, but whoever that person or those people might be, write down their name, and sometime this week, get in contact with them and bring this up. So, um, we'll go ahead and take that time for reflection. Uh, just take some time to enter into the presence of Jesus and ask for direction. Uh, as the music plays, you know, if it helps, you can, if you're with someone you and you feel stuck, feel free to talk to them and about your ideas. And Because the thing is, this is not a solo journey. It is a journey we go on with Christ. And it is a journey we go on with one another. Thank you. 
Let us go forth together to worship God with our whole being, our whole lives, and as we explore the depths of God and this life he has provided us with, let us also come to know the untold, boundless, beautiful love that God has for each of us. Amen.